Um, I, I now want to introduce uh, Michael Ekstrand and Hoda Merpoyan, who will talk to us about how to build bridges between research on fairness and research on privacy, uh, which I think caps off the work in this section uh, really nicely. And um, then after that will be lunch, and uh, because of that, just please kind of keep a point on your questions uh, so that everyone can, can get to food uh, right on time, because we are about 10 minutes behind schedule. Thank you, Joshua, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, my colleague, uh, Michael Ekstrand, uh, whose work is uh, mostly in the area of fairness and recommender system, and myself, Hoda Mehrpuyan, which my work is in the area of uh, designing and developing a privacy management system, will uh, present our collaborative work uh, in the area of uh, privacy for all, ensuring fair and equitable uh, privacy protection. So the core question we want to raise, or the first of our core questions, uh, that I think builds off of the bridge between some of Dr. Sweeney's earlier work and then connecting it to this conference is, is privacy fair? So we're talking a lot this weekend about uh, various definitions of fairness and how to understand fairness uh, as a desirable objective in our socio-technical systems. We've been studying privacy for a long time in technological systems and an even longer time in legal and other human systems. And so what we're trying to do is bring those sets of questions together and ask, is privacy fair? We also want to go beyond looking uh, at the fairness of privacy itself to looking at other interactions between fairness and privacy in a system in which they arise. Um, do they help each other? Do they hurt each other? Do they do this weird squiggly thing that we don't completely understand? And there's a lot of work to do to explore this space and we want to bring those, uh, those together. So we've got a lot of different, a lot of the work that has to be done first is definitional. We have many different definitions of fairness. Um, Arvin's gonna be talking about a bunch of them in his tutorial this afternoon. Uh, but we also need to think about defining privacy. As there are many definitions for, uh, for fairness, there are also many definitions for privacy. And uh, we, are, we are just gonna go uh, and review uh, a, a tiny bit of this uh, space. The first definition of privacy is based on seclusion, the right of the person to be left alone. Uh, in this uh, definition, privacy is achieved through complete uh, seclu uh, seclusion. So the second definition of the privacy is based on the Fourth Amend Amendment of U.S. Constitute, which uh, is the person's right, individual's right, uh, to be from, from unwarranted uh, government uh, intrusion, private information. The limitation theory of privacy identifies privacy with limitations placed on the ability of someone to access or make use of information about the person who's said to have privacy. The next definition is based on uh, control theory, which enables the user to, to take control of what information they would like to disclose under what circumstances and uh, basically accept, uh, give user the control. And the last definition we want to consider is contextual integrity, which grounds privacy in the norms and expectations of the context in which the information was originally provided. And so privacy is said to be maintained when those norms and those expectations are being upheld. A strong form of this, very strong form, is purpose binding, which prohibits any use of the information for purposes other than that for which it was originally provided, but there are also more subtle and nuanced definitions of contextual integrity. The core idea being, are the original norms and expectations associated with the data being upheld throughout its use and disclosure? Now that, now that we have uh, provided you with the definitions, we would like to lay the, uh, lay the groundwork for integrating the interaction between fairness and privacy. So the core question is, is that, is privacy fair? Uh, and we, we need to say that in some uh, cases, for example, we can, uh, we, in some definition, it depends, right? It depends on the situation and all of that. And we know that in a differential privacy, guarantees are fair. But we, throughout this uh, talk, we want to see whether that's the whole story. 
And it is also important to look at the different uh, connection that fairness and privacy has, especially uh, seeing the, uh, the much of the US ground privacy discourse on fair information uh, practices, which ties that closely to individual fairness. The core of our argument is that we need to take the tools that we've developed for interrogating the fairness of particularly a lot of our decision-making systems, and we need to turn those same tools on understanding privacy and understanding whether privacy schemes are producing fair and beneficial outcomes and protections. And to help frame that, we've had, we've grouped, we have a number of research questions that group into three broad categories. And the first is, is a technical or a non-technical privacy protection scheme fair? And we're not just interested in technological mechanisms for preserving privacy, but anything that's intended to preserve privacy in a socio-technical system. Laws, practices, social norms, are these providing their protections and providing their benefits in a fair fashion? And then uh, the, the, the two additional questions going both directions on the relationship, some, does privacy get in the way of fairness? Or can a privacy key scheme impede our ability to provide uh, fair decision-making processes? Or vice versa, can fairness constraints impede or enhance our ability to provide uh, privacy in a system or a context? As Dr. Sweeney earlier mentioned, uh, many organizations, they provide data sets uh, to public uh, for research purposes. Movie Lens, Netflix are some of those examples. And most of these data sets, they are anonymized to protect the privacy of subjects. However, it's, uh, it's often it's possible to break this and de-anonymize uh, the data. So there are two problems. Given the, da the data entry, we are able to identify these subjects, or if uh, we know the person, are we able to find them in a data set? So the question is uh, if, the, if it is easier to be able to identify a vulnerable member of the, uh, of the uh, classes in that data set. Um, an example is the New York uh, taxi cab uh, data that we were able to identify the um, Muslim drivers. And these kinds of attacks are not just possible against offline data sets. So we have a data set, we can de-anonymize it, okay, we have a privacy attack there. They're also possible against a lot of online systems. Uh, we can launch attacks against online systems to, get inf to disclose information about other users. My own field is uh, primarily recommender systems. There have been demonstrated attacks where through creating fake accounts and manipulating uh, your behavior, you can get the recommender system to cough up information about the preferences and purchasing patterns of other users of the system. Um, this also is not just limited to individual systems, but the whole, these systems exist in broader contexts and they can have very complex and subtle interactions with those contexts. For an example of how subtle those interactions can be, I want to talk about a story that caught my eye a number of months ago regarding James Comey, a former director of the FBI. And he mentioned in an interview that he's on Twitter now, because he needs to be, and he's on Instagram and has nine friends. Three little pieces of information. Ashley Feinberg said challenge accepted. She found his son, who's a college basketball player, on Twitter and Instagram, sent him a friend request from an Instagram account she uses for, for doing some journalistic investigation. He accepted it. Instagram then did what a lot of social platforms do recommended some additional people that she might want to be friends with since she just became friends with this basketball player. One of them was this curious account. Reinald Nybor had nine friends. <laughs> A little bit of Twitter searching and came to the conclusion that was later confirmed this is almost certainly James Comey's Twitter account. So whether or not it's a good thing to be able to identify the secret Twitter accounts of public officials, there's nothing in this chain of events that keeps this from coughing up information regarding someone who is trying to still have a life in a new community while on the run from an abusive family member. And we need, as a, as a recommender systems person, this made me think about we need to be very, we need to understand the ways that the information our systems make available interacts with their broader context but in the setting that we're talking about today, we also want to think about 
How are the impacts of these kinds of breaches distributed? Is it easier to launch this kind of attack against a member of an already vulnerable group? Are privacy attacks more effective against members of protected classes? There is a reason for this question to be second in our slides, and that's this instance of a more general question that we have, and that is whether the, uh, does the system basically provide a comparable privacy, a comparable privacy protection to different groups of, uh, groups, uh, of subjects. So in this case, for example, if uh, practices and policies that it puts in, it's in, put in place by a medical provider, does it provide uh, efficient and equal uh, fairness for all, or protection, basically, for all patients? So this would bring us to our uh, proposed definition of fair privacy, which is not the only definition by any means, but we are, we are hoping that it's a, it's a useful uh, starting point. Basically, a privacy scheme is group fair if the probability of failure and expected risks are statistically independent of the subject's membership in a protected class. So the key idea is that you are protected equally well uh, the, with regardless of your uh, class membership. With the definition, we can start to ask questions like, is differential privacy fair? Or perhaps more relevantly, is a, part, is a particular privacy scheme using differential privacy as a building block fair? And at a first, a first pass, yes. If a system is epsilon dead to differentially private, which is how the, the, the definition works, it provides that level of, it's that private for all members of the, of the data set. But we wonder if that really is the whole story. It establishes a bound, a limit on the amount of information that can be leaked. But there's nothing in the definition that require, that prevents some subjects from, in practice, having less data leaked. So if the majority class in practice experiences a greater degree, you could have a tighter bound on the information leakage for them, we question whether it's truly fair. And also, there's a trade-off in differential privacy between the accuracy of the system that you're embedding it into and the strength of the privacy guarantee. And that gets us to the first point where our definition is not complete enough yet, where if the minority or protected class pays a higher price than the majority class for the privacy they obtain, can we say that the privacy scheme is truly fair? So, yeah, the, so let's assume that the uh, system provides a comparable protection. Uh, still, uh, you cannot say the system is fair. So we need to see whether it does cost more for the vulnerable group to, uh, to get, achieve that protection. And with this, we need, to, we need to probe what's happening with fairness and privacy in individual systems. But we also need to do a lot of mapping out to, in order to build a robust theory of fairness and privacy to understand the robustness of our of privacy, fairness, and fair privacy to changes in threat models or violation of assumptions, to understand the properties of a context, of an application, of a privacy mechanism that makes it easier or harder to make it fair, both uh, continuous properties and also bright line properties. Are there things we can identify that, yeah, we can look at that, say, if the privacy system has this, it's impossible to make it fair. Um, and how those relate to other properties that may need to be sacrificed in order to achieve uh, fair privacy, such as system accuracy. Now that we have talked about uh, privacy and fairness, we would like to uh, raise some questions about other interaction that privacy and fairness might have. The first is that the question is uh, whether privacy impedes fairness. Can we use privacy to enable and audit a fair decision-making process? And already some work has been done in, in, this, in this area. The second question is that um, whether the, the privacy technologies and mechanism can uh, help fairness. Uh, we, don't, we know that the Dwork's, uh, Dwork's uh, foundational uh, work uh, for fair learning mechanism is based on the mathematics of uh, differential privacy. Is there any other uh, techniques and approaches that it can uh, help fairness? We also want to take these the other direction and look at uh, the way if we impose fairness constraints either technically or legally, what do those do to the privacy of the system? And can, are there fairness technologies that go and can provide uh, privacy guarantees? 
Now, we've asked a lot of questions, so at this point we would ha be happy to take any answers or other questions that you might have. mostly of clarification. I just want to be sure I really understand um, the suggestion from the James Comey example. So you talked about how people's privacy might be sort of accidentally impeded by these recommender, recommender systems that recommend other people in a network. And the example that you use for why this might impact vulnerable groups is um, people trying to leave an abusive home situation, right? And my assumption is that the reason that that, that that's the group that you talk about is that the assumption is that that maps onto protected classes in some way. Although that's, that's actually, that's a clarification question, but I have another question that's more important than that. The, the other question I have is, is the suggestion that people within that group, say like victims of intimate partner violence, are more likely to suffer these privacy harms, or is it that should they suffer these privacy harms, the impacts on their life are disproportionate? Because it feels like the answer is the second, but I'm not sure how that reads with the rest of, of the statements that you guys made. So I'll start with the second question about the, the, the likelihood of suffering the harm versus the, the impact of the harm. And I think that both are relevant. The impact question seems to be clear. Yes, they're going to suffer significantly more harm than someone who's not in that kind of a situation. But the other one I think is an area of open research. Is there, is it easier because of the structure of networks who tend to surround people in those kinds of situations, make it easier to carry out the attack in the first place. And that's where I think we just don't know. Um, regarding the, the relationship of that with protected classes, um, there may be a mapping to protected classes, but also if we think about protected classes generally, we could think, if we're thinking about privacy in a social media recommender, we might think about those in, dangerous situations or leaving dangerous situations as a protected class. We want our system to protect those who are in abusive uh, social situations. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rowan. I work at BuzzFeed. So this whole recommender system thing, really interesting to me. Um, I, so what I wanted to ask is sort of what do you see as kind of the next area of research to keep recommender systems from exposing that kind of vulner vulnerability. Uh, one of the things I'm thinking about a lot is the, uh, the woman who was revealed as being pregnant to her parents via the Target advertising. Um, and so that seems like another recommender system run amok. And I'm just wondering sort of what that research kind of looks like. The direction that seems the most promising immediately to me there is to think about the information content of recommendations and the amount of new information providing this recommendation introduces into the context. And I think that could be a way to start thinking about that um, because I, if a recommendation provides no new information, it's probably not a good recommendation, it's a reminder. But thinking about if, if this recommendation is going to create a social connection that very few other people have, that perhaps is a higher and riskier level of information disclosure than if it's not gonna make as much of a marginal impact. So the, the, f the first place I would want to start there is thinking about what information is being, uh, is being presented there. Hi, um, so my, my question is about the implication of this research for social services. So what, there's a disproportionate amount of data that we collect from people who are poor, who are applying for SNAP benefits, things like that, requiring drug tests, tying those to certain benefits. Um, it seems to me like in some ways, the way that we've accepted the data collection for folks who are applying for those benefits is somewhat disproportional by nature because you're collecting a huge amount of data on certain people that are already potentially a non-protected class. So what are the implications that you think of this research for um, specifically that sector? So, um, so you mean if uh, you have, uh, so I just want to make sure that I understand the question, right? So if you say if you uh, collect data with regard to a specific class, then you'll be less likely to be uh, able to identify uh, other vulnerabilities in that, in that uh, data set. So this isn't specifically about re-identification. Um, this is more about sort of the way that we collect data from people and how, how much 
um, view we expect into their lives. And it sounds like there's potentially a disproportionality between wealthier Americans and, and poorer Americans in that context. Exactly, yes. So um, I, I would say that uh, what we want to protect against is that exactly what you said, whether wealthy uh, versus uh, poor or uh, gender biased and all of that. So uh, the cynical answer is just surveil more people. But <laughs> and, and, and there's actually, there's the, one of the examples that we didn't make the cut in the final, in the final uh, talk, but we talk a little bit about in the paper, is thinking about credit scoring in terms of this. Because credit bureaus are kind of the surveillance apparatus that's surveilling a lot of people, but the existence of that surveillance is providing benefit, is a part of the tool of providing benefit of, of improving access to credit for people who historically had it denied. But with that comes, we're surveilling the majority class too. I don't know that that definition is actually going to fly, but I don't think we, I don't have a good answer right now for what we should do with that. I think we should think about it as a problem, but the solution space is very unclear to me right now. All right, and, and with that, I, uh, I have the distinct pleasure of inviting everyone to lunch in Greenberg Lounge across the hall. Um, thank you very much, Michael and Hoda for your excellent work, and I hope we can continue this conversation throughout the, the day and tomorrow and uh, through lunch. So thank you, everyone.